We are back. Sam Cedar on the Majority Report on the phone. It is a pleasure to welcome back to the program at the behest of the Central Intelligence Agency, uh, <laughs> National Political Correspondent. Never gets old. Never does. It doesn't. It actually, it, it's, <laughs> it's ongoing. The uh, National Political Correspondent for the Washington Post, uh, Dave Weigel. Now, Dave. Uh, uh, before I brought you on, you said you were uh, working on uh, three hours of sleep. If it makes you feel any better, I'm I'm almost right there with you. Cool. I think we're, we're both going to start babbling coherently the more we talk, so let's get to it. Yes, let's do this. So um, you were uh, in D.C. last night watching from the, uh, the control center. Let's start. I mean, we, you know, I've already top-lined some of the big, uh, um, um, I guess, headlines from this. What... what was there anything that particularly surprised you that you saw out there? Uh, so I almost want to start with something that didn't surprise me, which was having been to a lot of these suburbs where Democrats were, were gaining. I, none, none of the House flips really shocked me. Even uh, Max Rose in Staten Island is one that popped out to a lot of people last night. Uh, having covered him, having covered Donovan, Donovan was kind of like a sleepy, entitled incumbent. Rose was impressive, and there was a big Democratic advantage there that he turned out. Uh, so the, 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 I'll start with the opposite of your answer. Now that because the things that surprised me are the same things that surprised everybody else. Um, uh, point I'm making um, everywhere today is that uh, look, Democrats got more votes for governor in uh, Maryland. Maryland both stands out, Ohio and Florida, than Republicans got when they won those races in 2014. And going into this, Democrats kind of had a mantra, uh, a little bit of positive thinking, a little bit of a little bit of data behind it, that if it was a high turnout election, they were going to win. And there are states where that's true, right? Virginia, that's true. Nevada, that's true. Um, but that did not <laughs> that not happen this time. I was surprised uh, at the resilience of the Republican vote to come out for elections with uh, fairly uninspiring candidates at the top of the ballot for them. Uh, that's just not, it's not how Democrats behaved in the midterms in, t- in 10 and 14, you know, to their long lasting uh, political de- detriment. So what do you think, I mean, what accounts for that? I mean, so, so just to be clear with what you're saying is that uh, Democrats out, uh, you know, overperformed um, mm-hmm. from their baselines uh, the problem is that Republicans overperform from their baselines, and maybe their baseline's a little bit higher, but they still overperform too. Like we saw this in the special elections, uh, it seems to me that we had both parties overperforming uh, the the typical special election numbers, uh, but it just so happened that Democrats outperformed, uh, uh, overperformed uh, just a little bit more. And in these instances, mm-hmm. they didn't. I mean, what what do you think accounts for that? Well, so everyone's going to have the same take on this, which is that there's just been a, a, a resettling of people's base of the political bases in this country. Uh, you know, Sherrod Brown is a great re- example to watch here. Uh, Debbie Stabenow is a great example to watch, although very different races, where um, there are those those maps in those states look like. Uh, look like the Obama 2012 map, and the governor's ra- in the governor's race in Ohio it looks like the Trump map. There's only one county in Ohio, I think the Turnbull County, um, that voted for um, Trump in 2016, voted for Richard Cordray tonight, and this is despite Cordray running a much a much better campaign than Hillary Clinton, not having her vulnerabilities going into election day, very popular. Uh, so you you have a, the sorting that you're, you're seeing some kind of apocalyptic thinking today from people like Ian Milheiser at the Center for American Progress saying if we're just heading into a period where, red, you know, conservative voters will not vote for Democrats at any level for anything, uh, it's hard to see how they ever win back the Senate. Uh, you know, Republicans have had this sort of thinking before and been proven wrong and, and come back, but certainly there hasn't been hard Democratic thinking about how to compete, you know, let's say in Nebraska again. Uh, and the last time they achieved anything is when they could win Senate seats in Nebraska. Right. I mean, so the idea being that these sort of tribal allegiances are hardening and the the enthusiasm. I mean, we we would have anticipated a, a lull in the enthusiasm in Republicans that we're not seeing. Is that a function of Donald Trump going up there and just 
you know, I mean, because uh, the like two days mm-hmm. ago, it you know everybody was saying there's a there's a Trump tax. It costs you four points everywhere. I mean, is that is that the case? Is it is it different? So on a Senate so level, yeah, on I a think House level, uh, or in a governor's level? I mean, what? How, how do you sort that out? I, it's 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 very consistent actually. So it, there's no state where Republicans, the exception of you know the blue states that have Republican moderate governors, there is no place where Republicans did better in this election than Trump did in 2016. Uh, he they ran behind him in, in races they won, like in Indiana they got about half of his margin, Tennessee about half of his margin, in uh, in Missouri about you know. McCaskill's going to lose by six in a state that he he won by nineteen. Um, so if that tax, you know, carried carried out around the country, uh, that does you you have a situation where it's hard for Republicans to win the House, and it's actually the president. I think starts twenty twenty as an underdog. Uh, you know, he's got a good economy, but he has an electoral map that looks a lot more like the one that reelected Barack Obama, you know, minus Ohio, um, more strength for Democrats in Virginia and Colorado. And then in the long term, you know, this Florida Amendment 4, which is going to lead to a couple hundred thousand people coming on the rolls of Democrats. So you, it's just because of the way the Senate map was structured. Let's say, you know, you, you picked up the Senate, made a chart, and just put half of it on the ballot this year. Probably the Republicans would have lost a couple seats. Right. Um, they managed to pick up. Uh, we'll see at the end of the night, for, or the end of the week. What did they pick up? Maybe four seats in places that uh, the president had won. So four of the ten states the president had won, they they gained. Uh, in the one Senate se- Senate seat up this year, where a Republican was up and and Hillary had won, they lost, right. and they lost at despite leading in the polls. So that sorting, I, I, the word tribe gets used a lot. I'm not what to call it. Not sure what to call it, but look, uh, where people, where people um, were outnumbered in 2016, uh, only in a couple cases did Democrats outperform, sorry, in, uh, did Republicans uh, outperform, and that was just when they had moderate governors. Everywhere else, they ran behind it. Okay, so, I mean, it, to boil it down on some level, it's there are some states that are very supportive of Trump. And in those states, Uh um, the the Republicans did well. There are some states where he's not uh, uh, supported and the Republicans did poorly. And it just so happened, the luck of the draw, this cycle, um, and and presumably, right, every six years from now, uh, right, um, there's going to be more Democrats incumbent democratic incumbents up for re-election well i guess now it'll be (laughs) republicans too uh because they picked up four but we'll be up for re-election then significantly more it was like uh two-thirds more right uh democrats were up Uh for re-election and and so we i mean we were talking about this in 2015 even Uh uh, in anticipation mm-hmm. of 2016, people were like, the 2018, they, the, the Democrats have to get the Senate in 2016 because in 2018 they're going to get uh, wiped out. I mean, that was... That's yeah, just- it was this very realistic conversation where I, I remember the stakes were, uh, okay, well, if we let, if, if Hillary gets elected, um, she's got two years to do kind of anything at all, and then they're going to have, have 60 Senate seats. But at least she gets to appoint judges, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it, it, that's a good it's good to, uh, that you bring that up too because i've been thinking um right before the 2016 election i was in uh, utah and i talked to uh jason chaffetz who at the time was going to continue leading the house oversight committee and he was promising if they won they were going to spend the two well, four years but the first two years investigating hillary clinton and it was pretty pretty honest about this they were just going to have hearings because they said okay well she wins by accident we're going to beat her in 18 and 20. Um, Repub- and Republicans are kind of that ruthless in public and Democrats are not. Yeah. And the Democrats aren't that ruthless in private either, it feels like. No, actually, yeah. Good point. 